hello to my favorite church family. Now, if anyone ever asks you who has the best church family in the world, you tell them that Forest Park First Baptist does. You have made an amazing record here with 746 personal contacts with our M6 initiative. There have been 154 voicemails. You have prayed 202 times with people that you're talking to, and there have been 29 needs that have been met. That is an amazing job by this church family. Our Mission Forest Park has changed just a little bit. Uh, we're not doing just the first and third Wednesdays anymore. We've gone to a weekly thing where we hand out groceries Monday through Thursday from 8.30 to 10 o'clock. You can come and get one bag of grocery per family per week. And you can get a sack lunch at that time also. We're going to have to have some more bags filled up before long. So watch your text messages and see if the call goes out to come and help us bag some more groceries. We're trying not to over communicate with you, but we're still using the phone tree. We still have the text messages and we're doing Facebook and our website to get out the information to all of our people. Now, if you are not on the text message line, that's easy to take care of. You just text the message at FBFP to the phone number 81010, and that information is on your screen. So sign up for our text messages by just doing those two simple steps. Our online giving is doing really great, but that's not the only way that you can send in your tithes to the church. We still have the mail. You can put it in an envelope, mail it in the regular mail, or you can bring it by the church. You can put it in the mailbox, or you can just come in and leave it if you want to. Now, one person one time said, life is not about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. Now, you may not want to learn how to dance in the rain, but one thing that everybody can do when you're tired of watching reruns or tired of doing housework or tired of going to the grocery store, you can pray. Pray is what all we can do. Now, let's move into a time of prayer with Ron Dodson. Good morning. I think one of the more important ministries of the First Baptist Church of Forest Park is our time together in prayer. And I just pray that as we are meeting this way, that at home you will take the time and the opportunity to pray. I hope you've been receiving your prayer list by text message and have taken notes on it and just pray God that you will use it daily. Let me read 1 Peter from chapter 5, verse 7. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. We like to give God praises for the things he's done for us in our lives. One of the praises we have this week is Tiffany, a young person in the church. A few weeks ago, her cousin's house burned. We're glad to say that they have a new place to live and have received many donations. So we praise God for that and remember to do so as we pray. In prayer requests, Tammy Lowe, one of the members of the First Baptist Church of Forest Park, passed away this past week. Pray for her family, Billy and Jonathan. Also, Linda Longwell's brother, Ronnie Majors, and her, her, sister, uh, her sister-in-law, Jeanette Majors, both tested positive for COVID-19. They're both doing better and eating. Now, their daughter-in-law, Rebecca, has tested positive. So be in prayer for them. Nina Edwards has two family members with COVID-19, Teresha, Teresha Davis and Theodore Cannon. Also, let's remember Aaron Panalilio as he lost his job, was laid off this week, and one of our youth's dads, Antoine's dad, was laid off. So let's remember to pray for them and the many others that have been laid off during this time. So let's just join together wherever you are in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you, first of all, to praise you for the many things you've done for us, the things you've provided for us, for food and for clothing and for, for all you, we have during this time. We praise you, God, for these uh, praises that we've listed here on the prayer list. We know, God, that as we are praying for other people, it thrilled you. We know that intercessory prayer is one of the most important prayers we can do. And I just praise you, God, for allowing me through the Holy Spirit to come to you, to speak to you, knowing God, it pleases you also. 
We pray, God, that everything we say and do during these times, we will have you on our minds and on our hearts. I just pray, God, now that as we go through the rest of this service, you will be with each one of us. Let our hearts and minds be open to what is said, and let us, God, just praise you and all that you do. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, when I was in college, every winter break, my friends and I would get together and we would always go on a ski trip. Well, one year we decided to really put our money where our mouth is and we gathered our funds and we went out to Breckenridge, Colorado. Now look, we're East Coast boys, and so we had never seen mountains that big, mountains that high that just seemed to go on forever. We had never seen that rich, powdery snow. We had only skied in the wet, slushy, nasty stuff up on the East Coast. And so we were excited. We had, you know, gotten all our gear together and, and got out on the, on the ski slopes and, and got on that first lift ride. And if you've ever been skiing, there's kind of three levels of, of ski slopes. There's the green bunny slopes that are barely hills at all. That's where little kids start out their days and learn how to ski. Then kind of in the middle of the mountain are the blues. And, and blues can vary a good bit, but in general, they're, they're pretty wide open. They're fairly easy. Um, but they're enough to get the experience. And then all the way at the top of the mountain are these black diamonds, these bl single black diamonds and double black diamonds. And up there, that's where the crazy people hang out. And so we knew we didn't want anything to do with that. So my buddies and I, we had been going all morning. We had found this blue run. We were happy right there, sort of in the middle of the mountain. And, and we had just been making that trip all day long. We could go as fast as we wanted to. There were a couple of jumps. We could bob and weave, and, and we could, you know, throw snow on each other and just goof around together. It was a lot of fun. And so we had just been all morning long just sort of making that same run, up to the blues, all the way down the mountain, cutting up, having a great time, back on the lift, back up to the middle of the mountain. It was perfect. We were having a blast. Well, a friend of mine, Joey Wong, we got down to the bottom of the mountain, and he and I got on the, the ski lift. And you know how the, the lift hits you in the back of the knees and kind of tosses you back into the chair? And so we were settling into the chair and taking off up the mountain, going back to that normal blue run. And as we were looking up the mountain, we could see that familiar ridge, that, that place where we had been. But we noticed that this time our feet seemed a little higher off the ground than we were used to at this point in the mountain. And so as the lift kept climbing, we, we came up over the top of that very familiar ridge that we had been on, that blue run, that, that space that was so comfortable. And, and, and as we looked down, we could see our friends that were getting off of a different chairlift, and they were kind of looking up at us like, uh-oh, you guys have made a big mistake. I think it had sort of dawned on them faster than it dawned on us what we had done. But when we realized that we were not going to land in the place that we thought we were, in the place that we intended to go, in that old familiar comfort zone, we began to look up the mountain and we could see the lift that we were riding never stopped. It just kept going up and up and up. In fact, it went up past the clouds and seemed to disappear into oblivion. Well, he and I started looking at each other really nervously, and we realized our mistake, and that is we had gotten on the wrong chairlift, and we were headed to the top of Breckenridge, Colorado. And so we rode that lift up through the clouds, got to the, past the tree line, and got to the very top of the mountain and dumped off, and, and we came around the corner, and I'll never, ever, ever forget this moment. We were standing on the ridge at the top of the mountain, and the ridge just disappeared. It wasn't even a hill. It just gone. It was just like looking over the edge of a table. And there was this top of a pine tree sticking up, and you could just barely see the top of it right over the ridge, and it was so close that you thought maybe you could just reach out and touch it. 
Well, Joey and I looked at each other, and we knew that we had no business being here. This, this was not part of the plan. This was a huge mistake that we had made. And in that moment, we knew that we had two choices. Choice number one, take off all of our gear, curl up into the fetal position, start crying, and wait for the helicopter. That's the choice that we probably should have taken. But being two young and dumb college students, we kind of looked at each other and, and, you know, we didn't really have to say much. We, we both really kind of knew what was about to happen, and, and we kind of both subconsciously, you know, and silently together made the choice to embrace the opportunity, and we were going to go for it. And so we skied up to that ridge, up to that what I would call a cliff, and kind of peered out over the edge there. And Joey went first. I guess he's more of a man than I am. But, you know, I'm not going to be left behind. And so I went right after him. And we started out sliding, and it was really more falling than skiing. But we were kind of managing, and we were cutting back and forth. And, and, and we sort of got, you know, began to get our legs underneath us and started to kind of figure it out. And we started picking up steam, and the confidence started growing. And, and we started, you know, the, the fear started to subside, and the fun started to kick in. And you could hear us laughing, and I could see this big smile across Joey's face. And I knew he could see the same smile on mine. And so we got about two-thirds of the way down the mountain, and we're just flying. If I had to guess, I'd say we were doing at least a 1,000 miles an hour, maybe more. So Joey and I are flying down this mountain at about Mach 4, and right in front of me, as I'm following Joey, suddenly he just disappears. This big poof goes up in front of me of white powdered snow, and there's no more Joey. And I was so close behind him, I didn't really have time to react. In fact, I couldn't really react at all. And in that moment, there was a second poof. Poof. And it was me inside this cloud of white powder. And what we know now is there was this hole that had really a really thin layer of loose powdered snow over the top of it. And we had both gone off into that hole and just disappeared into a poof. Well, skiers affectionately call the moments that followed a yard sale. So if you think about your yard at home when you do a yard sale, everything you own is just spread out everywhere. Well, that was the end result of this poof. Skis, poles, goggles, hats, gloves, part of my jacket, all kinds of stuff, just everywhere. Total yard sale all over the mountain there in Breckenridge. And so we started crawling around, gathering up our stuff, getting ourselves put back together. And when it was all said and done, I had a broken ski. That, that my right ski broke right behind my heel and was folded up the back of my leg. And to this day, if you go to Breckenridge, Colorado, I am quite confident there's a pair of goggles that belong to my friend Joey still buried in the snow about two-thirds of the way down that run at the top of Breckenridge. Well, we got ourselves gathered up, put back together, and skied down to the pro shop, skied down to the, to the, the lodge there, and Joey bought a new pair of goggles. I got a new pair of skis, and we walked out of the lodge, and as we walked out of the lodge back onto the bottom of the ski slope, you could see two chairlifts. There was a chairlift on the left, and that chairlift on the left went back to that same familiar blue run, that place where all of our friends were, that place where it was so comfortable, that place where we had been all morning. But the chairlift on the right went back to the top of the mountain. And so Joey looked at me, and I looked at Joey, we didn't really have to say much at all because I could tell by that crazy look in his eye, and I'm sure I had the same look in mine. We knew we were going back to the top of the mountain. And so up we went, and for the next three days, that's where you could find us, at the top of Breckenridge, getting better and better and better as we skied double black diamonds, as we saw scenery that we never thought we would see, and, and as we experienced things that we never thought we would ever have the chance to experience. 
years later, Joey was in my wedding. That, that day, those couple of days, laid the foundation and forged a lifelong friendship between me and Joey. Well, some of you right now in response to coronavirus probably feel a lot like Joey and I felt that day. You found your place, you found yourself in a place where you have no business being. You're not really sure how we got here. How, how did everything that I trust, everything that I depend on, all of my routines, all of my relationship, how did that just suddenly come to an end and be grind to a halt? Kind of feels like we got on the wrong lift somewhere. We're thinking, man, if we could just back up a month or two and maybe make some different choices, maybe we would not be in this scenario. We're all wondering in this moment, how did we get here? You know, it's that fear of the unknown. I've been reading all kinds of, you know, articles and listening to news, uh, you know, news radio and reading newspapers and things, and everybody's trying to predict the future, but they're all saying something different, and nobody really knows what's going on. And, and so all we know is that we can't see over that next ridge. We have no idea what we can see just past the next coming days. And so that fear of the unknown begins to take over, and reality begins to set in. Well, in this moment... I think we have two choices. And it's very similar to the choices that Joey and I faced at the top of Breckenridge. I think we got two choices. One, we can just huddle up. We can just lay down in a ball. We can admit defeat. We can just cry our way out and just wait for something to change or wait for a Savior. Or we could get a little bit of a crazy look in our eye and we could choose to embrace the opportunity. You see, I think God has given us something that we may never, ever get for the rest of our lives. He's giving us a chance to pursue him without any distractions at all. There's an opportunity here. And that opportunity is to experience a deep and intimate relationship with God through meaningful prayer. Because quite frankly, prayer is all we have left. We can't come to church. We can't really worship together. We can listen to recordings, but that's not the same as being together. We can't sit in our Sunday school classes. We can't fellowship together down in the fellowship hall. We, we, we've lost all uh, ability to join one another and to participate in all of the fun things, all of the rewarding things, all of the exciting things about church. But what we haven't lost is is any avenue to pursue our relationship with God. You see, what remains is the only thing that matters, and that is our own personal relationship with God. Without any distraction, without anything to get in the way. So I think we have an unparalleled opportunity here to experience a deep and intimate relationship with God through meaningful prayer just like Joey and I at the top of the mountain had an opportunity to experience things that we had never thought about before. So what is God saying in this moment? Well, turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. And I'm going to paraphrase it for you uh, just for a second, because we're going to come back to the details of this verse. But Paul writes this, I have not stopped praying. Wow. What's the one thing that we have left when it comes with our, to our relationship with God? It's prayer. It's that deep, personal, intimate communication with God. That's the one piece of the puzzle that we have left. And so may we never stop pursuing it. Paul says, we have not stopped praying that you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. You see, when it comes to prayer, Paul's desire for his church that he plants and my desire for our church and my desire for my family and my desire for you is that you will learn to know God better and better because of the opportunity of this moment. 
You see, this actually, this prayer life, this sentiment towards his churches actually becomes fairly common for Paul. You can find almost the exact same phrases in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3 and also Philippians 1. And you'll notice in Paul's letters, he almost always opens with some kind of prayer for those that he's writing to. Prayer to Paul was of central importance, was very, very important. And so today, as God is calling us into prayer, and he's saying, hey, if you'll pursue this, you will grow as you learn to know me better and better. I'm challenging you to embrace the opportunity. So if you'll come with me, I'm saying, let's jump off that ridge. Let's ski down that mountain. Let's experience something together that we never thought we would have the opportunity to experience before. I don't know if you can tell, but I got that crazy look in my eye. And some of you, I know, are looking back at me the same way. And you're saying, yeah, we can do this. We can, we're ready for this new adventure. We're ready to experience God in a new way. Well, let me share with you something that I've been doing for the last several weeks that has been revolutionary for me. Multiple times in my life with God and my relationship with God, I've set out, <coughs> excuse me, I've set out to do a prayer journal. And I've heard people that have had tremendous success with them. Carrie Skinner in, in our church family is one who's been journaling and, and praying daily with God for many, many years. And so I, maybe I'm aspiring to be like Carrie or maybe there's just this innate desire in me to pursue God as God calls me to himself. But I gotta be honest with you, I've just never really found success with a prayer journal. There's all kinds of different systems out there and different ones that you can buy and they come in all kinds of different bindings and whatnot but but they always seem to fail in this way they always seem to start out really well because they're very structured but over time that structure becomes formulaic and as that formula begins to set in as that routine begins to set in you kind of lose the joy you kind of lose the intimacy you kind of lose that dynamic relationship and it just becomes routine. It just becomes sort of a rut that I find myself in. Well, recently I set out because I think structure is good, but, but we don't want to get so structured that it becomes formulaic. So I set out to try to find something that would allow me to collect my thoughts, but, but allow me the same flexibility in those moments with God to experience a dynamic relationship. And so I want to share with you what I've been doing. I've actually got my prayer journal here with me. And so I want to put up on the screen some of the things that I've been doing and, and how I've approached this. And, and, and I'm going to encourage you to do this. So, so starting right now, this is your homework. So if you don't have a journal, you can order one from Walmart or Amazon. If you, got, if you can't get one of those, you probably got some paper laying around the house. You're, you know, feel free to use that. And if you can't get that, then order some food in from your local restaurant and ask them to send you a stack of extra napkins. It'll work just fine. But at whatever you're choosing to write with or write on, I'm going to give you the system that I've been using. So I'm going to throw my prayer journal up on the screen, and it has four basic sections. Section number one, I just simply ask, what's on my mind? And I just sort of unload. So if you're like me, you got a lot of things swirling around right now. And especially if you haven't spent time with God for a long time, I'm going to tell you up front, this section is going to take you a while on the first day. Because it's kind of like catching up with an old friend. It's going to be a long, drawn-out conversation. And so 1 Peter 5 says, cast your cares before the Lord. That, that word cast in the Greek is almost, has, it's almost a little bit violent. It's like hurl your cares upon God. Just get it off your chest. Unload, vomit all over the table is a phrase that we use in counseling. So what's on your mind? And just start writing it down. Maybe there's joys. Maybe there's some celebrations. Maybe there's some victories. But maybe you're struggling with fear and anxiety and frustrations. Maybe you've got some old wounds and some old hurt that you're just begging God to take away or begging God to heal. Or maybe somebody else's situation 
is heavy on your heart. Whatever is on your mind, whatever is running through your mind at night as you're trying to sleep at night or or as, as you're going through your day, whatever is heavy on your heart, write it down and get it out. Write it down, put it on paper and lay it out before the Lord, before his feet. So now that's where I am. That's the human side of this. God, this is everything that I'm struggling with. This is all the things that are, that are heavy, and this is the burden that I'm carrying. And so here I lay it down before your feet. Well, the second section kind of reigns in some of that emotion and gets us recentered. And so the second section is simply my daily Bible study. Now, some of you haven't been doing a daily Bible study. Maybe you never have. If you've never done a daily Bible study, I encourage you to start in the book of John. If you have done one in the past and maybe you've stayed away for a while, I encourage you to start in the book of Romans. But just to kind of show you how this works, today we're in the book of Colossians. And we're just in one little section. We're looking at verses 9 through 14 as a church family. And so you don't have to read a whole chapter or a whole book or a whole page. You just read enough until God starts speaking to you. And as you read, just make some notes as to what God has said or what the Bible said, what stood out to you. So in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14, a couple things that stood out to me. You will grow as you learn to know God better. You will have complete knowledge of his will. He will give you spiritual wisdom and understanding, and he will produce every kind of good fruit in your lives. These are just phrases directly out of that passage of Scripture that just stood out to me as I went through them, and there's probably some more. So that's your second section. Section number one, what's on your mind? Section number two, let's get re-centered and refocused on God. Let's stand on that firm foundation of Scripture. Section number three, now we're going to pray. What's your prayer? Well, I've been doing this section in blue ink. You don't have to do this, but for me, I'm somewhat of a visual person. So I take my blue pen and I write the word prayer, and then I go back to all of the things that I've just spilled out before God and all of the things that I've just read in his word, and I circle and I underline and, you know, I kind of highlight however I want. I do it in blue because as I've laid my burdens out before God, clearly those are things I need to pray about. And as God has spoken back to me through his word, maybe there's some promises in there that I need God to fulfill. Maybe there's some things in there that I don't fully understand and I'm asking him for wisdom. So I'll go back and underline or circle or in some way make that stand out. And then after doing that, I will write out bullet points for my prayer. So a great way to start this, the great way to start prayer is, God, teach me how to pray. God, I'm pursuing you in the best way I know how, but, but you know, it can be a struggle sometimes. So God, teach me how to pray. Help me get to know you better. Help me grow. Take away my anxiety. Give me peace. Help me to understand. Help me to learn to hear your voice. Whatever's on your heart, just take it before God. And again, I choose to do it in blue ink because it makes it stand out. It's just a visual way to look at it. And then the final section I think is probably the most important, and I do it in red. It's listen. So what's on your mind? What is God saying, your daily Bible verse, your daily Bible reading? What is your prayer in blue? In the last section, take some time, stop, and listen. Well, God, through this whole process, might have already been speaking to you. So take your red pen and go back and circle and underline and highlight and make some notes if you need to. Again, this is there as a visual reference. So when you go back days, weeks, months later, you can still kind of experience that same moment with God. And then listen to what he says. So circle, highlight, underline, however you want to do it, and then write it down. And then I encourage you to write this conversationally. So in blue, I'm writing out, God, you know, teach me how to pray. It's I and me and, 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 and you. We're using that kind of language. But then when we write in the red section, write as if it's God speaking back. To you. And so listen, he will say things like, hey, you know, you can trust me. 
you know, if you keep following me and, and, and pursuing me in this way, you will grow. You know, this reminds me of another scripture that says, seek and you will find. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. So take a moment and just stop and listen and write down what God is speaking to you. And then here's the key. I'm challenging you to keep your prayer journal with you through the day because God will speak to you throughout the day. And as you hear his voice, write it down. Write it down. And so that system of praying together or or prayer journaling and praying with God has been really, really helpful for me over the last several weeks. And I think it's a system that I'm going to be able to stick with much longer than I have any other system. Now listen, it may not go that great the first couple of times. You're probably going to break a ski or you might lose a pair of goggles. But it's okay. Gather up your stuff, pick yourself up, and just keep trying. I will tell you one obstacle that you're going to run into. The first time you do this, it's going to take you a long time because you haven't done it in a long time. And so you're going to think, how am I ever going to get enough time in my day to do this? The first time I implemented this system in my life, I sat down for over two hours and I thought the same thing. There's no way that I have time to do this every single day. But you know what I found? As you stay consistent with it, the time needed gets shorter and shorter and shorter because it's consistent. And so it becomes this consistent, almost constant conversation with God. And that section of what's on my mind every day has gotten shorter and shorter and shorter because I've noticed that my mind is on the things of God and not on the distractions of the day. The other thing I've learned is where I used to think, how will I ever find the time to do this? I've learned in spending time with God and the things that that he tells me and the insights that I've gained, I don't have time not to do this. Over and over and over, it has saved me time, energy, and effort because God has set my path out in the right direction before the day even started. Now listen, maybe you're a morning person and that's great. You can do it in the morning. Maybe you're a night person. Do it at night and be prepared for the next day. There's no right or wrong. You've got to figure out what works for you. But doing something is always better than doing nothing. And so we've got an unprecedented opportunity right now to pursue God. Well, go with me back to Colossians 1, 9 through 14, and the whole passage says this. So we have not stopped praying for you since we heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live by the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Church, family, when we pursue an intimate, personal, meaningful relationship with God through prayer, look at the promises of that passage. Look what God promises that he will do. He will give us complete knowledge of his will. Who among us doesn't want to know his will for our lives? He will give us complete knowledge. He will give us spiritual wisdom and understanding. The way that you live will always honor and please the Lord. Our lives will produce every kind of good fruit. We will grow as we learn to know God better and better, and we will be strengthened by his glory. Glorious power. He will give us all the endurance and the patience that we need. And church family, if we pursue this together, we will be filled with joy. 
That's a ton of promises if, if we would just pursue God in a simple little prayer journal. And so listen, we're going to be talking about prayer for the next little while, for the next few months as a church family. And when I see you, I'm going to ask. And when our M6 team calls you, they're going to ask. And we want to see your prayer journal. We want to see what God is doing in your life. We want to see how he's moving. We want to hear the stories that he has put on your heart and how he's working. And so I want you to hold me accountable and I'm going to hold you accountable that we are going to embrace the opportunity that God has given us and pursue an intimate, meaningful, real relationship with God as a church family. Guys, if we will do that, we will come out of this crisis, out of the unknowns of coronavirus, stronger than we've ever been in our entire lives. And we will look back on today, we will look back on this moment, and we will thank God and praise God for what he did in and through our lives. It's exciting to be at the top of the mountain. It's exciting to push through the fear. And it's exciting to take those first steps over the ridge. But it's really exciting to do it together. God, thank you for the promises of your scripture. Thank you for the promises of prayer. God, I pray for my church family that as we pursue prayer with you, as we pursue daily, intimate, a daily intimate walk with you, God, that you would lean into us as we lean into you, that if we seek, we will find, that as we draw near to you, you would draw near to us. And God, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to hear your voice. Teach us how to recognize your truth from all the other noise going on around us. And God, thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to slow down and pursue what really matters. And so God, I pray for my church family that they would embrace that opportunity and they would find you to be faithful and loving and kind and deeply personal. So Lord, it's in your name we pray, and it's you who we pursue over the next several days, months, and hopefully even a lifetime. Amen.